switching was an idea which was specifically studied by Len Kleinrock at MIT, who was actually looking at message switching, and he did a brilliant uh, dissertation on the use of queuing theory to analyze what networks of queues would look like using this message switching approach. And his analysis, although we'd never used the word packet, uh, is as equally ap applicable to packet switching as it is to message switching. So that's one important milestone in around 1961. In 62 or thereabouts, Paul Barron uh, is doing work for the RAND Corporation and is deeply concerned about the ability to preserve command and control in a post-nuclear environment. And we were seriously worried that the Russians would actually launch and that we would suffer a nuclear attack and that we had to be able to respond and we needed command and control for that. So Paul, in 1962, before the existence of uh, integrated circuits or anything else, uh, is saying we really should be digitizing and packetizing voice and then using sort of uh, pole-mounted radios that are able to transmit in all directions to create a highly connected environment so that if holes were knocked out of it by nuclear explosions, you would still, if it's a fabric that's in any way connected, information could get from one end to the other. So he envisioned the notion of a message block and it was dynamically routed. He used hot potato routing. If you got something, you got rid of it as fast as you could. He chopped up the speech into little 20 millisecond pieces. He didn't talk so much about data as I remember it. And this was supposed to be a highly resilient voice network for command and control. I may have just done him a disservice because later uh, he was very much uh, conscious of the importance of data communication too. So that's around 1962. It gets documented in, in an 11-volume series called On Distributed Communications, and he can't sell it to anybody. The uh, traditional telcos, AT&T in particular, and the people at what was then the Defense Communication System, or Defense Communications Agency, laughed him out of the room, said this was a silly idea, it couldn't possibly work, and so, you know, he should just go away. So he never got anywhere with that, in spite of all the documentation. In 66, Larry Roberts, uh, along with one other guy whose name I'm now not remembering, does a point-to-point -point experiment to test packet switching. It was between the uh, ANSFQ7 uh, machine at, S at System Development Corporation in Santa Monica and uh, the uh, TX2 machine at MIT, at Lincoln Laboratories, which is where Larry was. They demonstrated on a 2400-bit you know, line, bit per second line, that you could move packets back and forth. Then in the 64 or 65 time frame, uh, a man named Donald W. Davies at the National Physical Laboratory in London also gets the bug, tries to get money from the uh, Science Research uh, Commission at, uh, at, in uh, England and gets only enough to build one node, you know, he, the one node network. So he builds this packet net, he invents the term packet to describe what these objects are, and it works. He's got a bunch of you know, terminals and other things hanging off of this one node. So in a, in a funny way, he built a local area network, if you like. Uh, but it was you know, based on physical wires. So those three guys introduced packet switching. Larry and uh, whoever it was that he worked with um, demonstrate that it's possible to get two very distinct kinds of computers to talk to each other using the standard way. Uh, J.C.R. Licklider is a, a psychologist, actually, at MIT. But he's convinced in the early 60s that computing is important to non-numeric processing, that it will allow people to work together and collaborate in ways that they never could before. He comes and starts the information processing techniques office at ARPA with this bee in his bonnet. And who does he encounter? He encounters Douglas Engelbart at SRI International, and the two bond, basically, because Engelbart was all about non-numeric computing and the ability of people to build up uh, the superstructure of communications and documents and interact with each other, hyperlinking, the mouse, the portrait mode display, back on white, black on white presentations. I mean, the, the guy had a world wide web in a box at SRI, and uh, Licklider understands that. Licklider sending out notes to his little community of, of people talking about the intergalactic network. I mean, he's tongue in cheek. Uh, so he really gets credit for having put this meme in place at ARPA. Then Taylor comes along to pick up the, the responsibility for running the IPTO from Licklider. 
and it's all hacked off because he's got three terminals in his office at the Pentagon connected to three different machines and he can't forget, he says, why can't there be one terminal talking to all three? We need a network. And so uh, as he's pursuing this idea uh, with uh, Charlie Hertzfeld, who's the head of ARPA at the time, Charlie hands him a million bucks over a 20 minute conversation. And now Taylor's got the problem, who's gonna actually do this? Because Taylor's not a technologist either. He's another you know, kind of psychologist type. So he decides to get Larry Roberts from Lincoln Laboratories who did that packet thing and Larry doesn't want to come. So he goes and complains about this to Charlie Hertzfeld. Charlie calls up the guy that runs Lincoln Laboratories and says, you know, we uh, pay for a significant fraction of your research budget every year. You should, uh, you should tell uh, Larry he should show up. Now, and in fact, I thought that maybe Larry had been forced to do this you know, by Charlie. I think it was probably a little less awful than that. But Larry was persuaded to come down. Eventually, of course, inherited the operation of the office from Bob Taylor, but in the meantime is the guy responsible for doing the, initiating the internet, or the ARPANET project. So they write an RFC, or an RFQ, request for quotation. A bunch of responses come back, probably on the order of a couple dozen. I don't know personally for sure how many. I know that I wrote one of them with my colleague, but, uh, uh, Steve Crocker, while we were still at UCLA as graduate students, but we were consulting with a company called Jacoby Systems in S Santa Monica. Jacoby Systems wrote one of the responses. Bolt Baranek and Newman wrote another response, primarily written by Bob Kahn, who came to BBN from MIT. So um, the responses come back and they get evaluated, and four of them end up, and the Jacoby Systems one isn't one of them, or if it was, it didn't get selected. BBN got selected. So Steve Crocker and I kind of hiked back to UCLA as graduate students. Uh, and the next thing we know, Glenn Kleinrock, who's at UCLA and who'd written you know, this original dissertation work on packet switching, has come to UCLA to teach and explore um, a queuing theory, is uh, a close uh, compatriot of Larry Roberts, because they were both at Lincoln Labs together. So he gets the network measurement center piece of the ARPANET project. And Steve Crocker and I and John Postel, all of us from the same high school in Santa Monica, or in uh, San Fernando Valley, end up in Len Kleinrock's uh, operation running the Network Measurement Center. So I was the principal programmer for that. Steve Crocker took the responsibility for managing and leading the network working group that led to the protocols, host-to-host -host protocols. And John Postel eventually becomes the keeper of the documentation. He's the RFC editor, which Steve Crocker started, request for comments. He's the guy that becomes the numbers czar, which is keeping track of address spaces and allocations, and eventually becomes the domain name manager or the internet assigned numbers authority when the internet happens. That hasn't happened yet. The, this period of time of the ARPANET uh, program it brings us up to 1972. And this is an important moment in this whole history because the first demonstration of the ARPANET happens uh, in the uh, Washington Hilton Hotel basement in October of 72. A whole bunch of people from the networking, interested networking community, packet switching community, attend not only in the US but from France and from England and Italy and Germany and elsewhere. Uh, that group of about 25 or 30 people uh, convenes, sees the ARPANET in operation, sees applications that were being done, uh, including Doug Engelbart's stuff, and then forms this international network working group modeled after the working group that Steve Crocker managed to build the ARPANET system. And at this point I become the chairman of that group because Steve is busy at ARPA doing artificial intelligence. Um, the next at the end of that year, Bob Kahn leaves Bolt, Baranek, and Newman and goes to, to ARPA. I leave UCLA, where I'd been working with Kleinrock and, and Crocker and Postel, and I go to Stanford. So Bob is at ARPA, I'm at Stanford, and in the spring of 73, Bob comes out from uh, ARPA and he says, I have a problem. He says, what's your problem? He says, well, we got this ARPANET. He says, yep. But we also are working on other networking capability to make command and control work for the military. If you're going to be serious about putting computers in command and control, they have to be mobile, they have to be in you know, armored personnel vehicles and tanks and all these other things. They have to be seaborne so we can have ship to ship and ship to shore communications, which means satellite. And we, uh, so we need mobile radio, we need satellite in addition to the fixed wire 
systems that are uh, represented by the ARPANET. We have fixed installations that are not moving around. So you have all these different technologies, and Bob's brilliant idea is not to build one network with all those technologies embedded in it. Instead, he breaks them apart and says, let's build a packet satellite network, which optimizes the use of satellite, takes into account that it's got a half a second round trip time. Let's build a packet radio network, which optimizes a system whose connectivity is changing with time as things move around and as you get variable delay and uh, also variable interference. So these were three different packet networks. Then the problem is how do you hook them together? You wouldn't have this problem if you put all the technologies into one net, but if you put them all into one net, it makes it really hard to do control over all these highly variable parameters. So instead, he says, break them into different networks and connect those together. So we design and build a gateway, which today we call a router. And that concept also introduced a whole bunch of other things, like how do you refer to another network? Each network thinks it's the only network in the universe. This is true of the proprietary networks like SNA and DECnet and so on. And uh, you didn't have a vocabulary that said, take this packet and move it to another computer on another network somewhere else that you might not even be connected to. So we have to invent an internet address space in order to solve that problem. We have to find a way to allow packet losses in this path to be recovered, which is where TCP now becomes a manager of reliability on an end-to-end -end basis instead of relying on each net to be reliable. The ARPANET was built on the assumption you could build a reliable underlying net. The internet was based on the assumption that no network was necessarily reliable and you had to do end-to-end -end retransmissions to recover. So during this, uh, this 1973 period, Bob and I get the papers, first paper written and published in IEEE Transactions on Communications, May of 1974. And I think mostly nobody paid too much attention to it. Meanwhile, ARPA is funding us to go make this actually work. At Stanford, I am working with my graduate students, some who are at Xerox Park, some are uh, at uh, Stanford, on the detailed specifications of TCP IP. We published that in December of 1974, and it's the first time the word internet shows up in print anywhere. This is the first papers we talked about internetworking. So internet shows up in a, in a complete spec in December of 74, and it's also got bugs, but we don't know that yet. Until we start implementing it in 1975 with two other organizations. So Bob Kahn says, we can't have just one implementation. Bolt, Baranek, and Newman becomes one of the implementers. University College London and Peter Kirstein's group in England is the second or third implementation. So we have three implementations of TCP IP. In fact, by this time, it's only TCP. We haven't broken off the IP part. Um, three implementations are going, we instantly find problems with the design, and we start evolving. So over a period from 1973 to 1978, we go through four iterations of the design and implementation and test until we have a fairly stable thing. And then we standardize. And so 78, we fix everything. It's, now by this time, the internet protocol has been split off because people like David Reed and Danny Cohen are saying, we need to have real-time communications that is not necessarily reliable, but which has low latency. So voice communications, radar tracks, and all that. You don't care where the missile was two seconds ago, you want to know where is it now. So, and in the case of voice, if you lose a packet, you just say, say that again, I missed something. So we split TCP into TCP and IP, and we create something called user data gram protocol, which is parallel to TCP, and it is the real-time low latency version of the reliable TCP. All of those little components, IP, TCP, and UDP, now go into the internet architecture starting in 1978, and we start implementing. For the next five years, we, start, we f do everything we can to get TCP IP implemented on every operating system we can find. It goes onto the IBM machines, it goes onto the de digital machines, HP, it goes into Unix. We have a Unix version built by Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. We send it out to Berkeley, to the Berkeley BSD release guys, and Bill Joy says, I don't like that code. He writes his own, puts it into BSD 4.2, and that's the version of uh, Unix that carries a lot of TCP IP to the academic world because at the same sort of time frame, Sun Microsystems comes along and builds these fantastic workstations, and they want to use open source, uh, or at least open protocols, uh, and uh, open operating systems. So they adopt Unix and the TCP IP comes with it. 
and they use Ethernet as a way of connecting the workstations together, so they are the engine that's driving the academic community, which are all gangbusters for workstations and high-speed local networking. So all of this, of course, places huge demands on the ARPANET uh, backbone, which is only running at 50 kilobits a second, and eventually leads to the need for higher speed. NSF jumps into the fray, seeing how valuable all this is for the academic community, and concludes that it should build a network that runs even faster, and it does so, and it's called NSFNet.